Well, thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, we are now ready to transition to the second half of our event. Um, we are very lucky that in addition to Judge Russell, we have a number of other distinguished guests who have agreed um, to stick around and have an informal discussion with us about veterans treatment courts. Um, so first I would just like to say thank you very much to Judge Russell for um, sharing your experiences and talking a bit about um, the Buffalo Veterans Treatment Court and how that started and really started a movement across the nation um, to better serve our veterans in our justice system. Um, just to your left, um, we have Judge Eleanor Sinnott, who is um, at our Boston Municipal Court here. She actually served uh, for 10 years in the Navy and is a former national or Navy intelligence officer. She became a judge in 2006 and established the Veterans Treatment Court here in Boston in January 2014. Uh, to Judge Senate's left, we have Judge Mary Hogan Sullivan. She um, founded the first Veterans Treatment Court here in Massachusetts. Um, she is a judge at the Dedham District Court and now presides over the Norfolk County Veterans Treatment Court. It was launched in 2012 um, after Judge Sullivan had learned about veterans treatment courts at a number of trainings and was motivated to bring that model to our state. And down at the end of our table here, we have Major Evan Simone, who is a professor at Mississippi College School of Law. Um, he runs the legal writing program there. But he is also a major in the Army Reserves and previously served for 12 years as an active duty judge advocate. Um, he has published a number of articles on uh, a variety of topics, but most important for today, um, he has spoken out about training attorneys and training judges um, in working with military veterans, uh, being culturally competent, and thinking about the particular issues that face our veterans in our criminal justice system, particularly those vet veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. So we are honored to have such a distinguished panel here today and uh, we plan to have a bit of an informal discussion, but we will open it up for question and answer at the end. We have a couple mics that we'll be able to send around the room, so we encourage you to um, ask some questions of our panelists and make this a uh, really engaging discussion. Just to start off, um, we heard a little bit about the, the history of veterans treatment courts um, nationally um, from Judge Russell. As of the end of 2014, I think there were 220 veterans treatment courts across the nation, and that number is growing um, every year. So I'd like to start by asking Judge Sinnott and Judge Sullivan if you could talk a little bit about your experiences um, in starting the veterans treatment courts here in Massachusetts and how you chose the model that you've established for your veterans treatment court. Judge Sullivan, would you like All to start? Right, I'll start. Um I uh, presided over a drug court um, in uh, Quincy and in Dorchester. And several years ago, the uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals had its annual conference uh, here in Boston. And I was able to attend one uh, day of the, that uh, conference. And because I wasn't currently doing a drug court, I wandered into a session on veterans treatment courts. And I ended up spending the entire day there um, because I was totally amazed at the work that um, was being presented. Uh, it coincided with the fact that <clears throat> I was a Marine mother and I had a son uh, deployed uh, in combat. He actually deployed five times. So I do have some, I had a personal interest um, in uh, taking a look at this issue. So uh, I went back to Dedham and uh, I took advantage of the fact that you can ask your staff to do things and when you're a judge they have to say yes. And so I put together a team um, with the support of the district attorney in Norfolk County. And we put together a team uh, and an application to go for national training. And uh, we, um, they had uh, several places that you can go to uh, on the West Coast, but we got picked to go to Tulsa. 
and we went to Tulsa, and I uh, re-met Judge Russell, who was one of the trainers there, and we put together our plan. As he indicated, you have to decide how you want to start have, run your court. Is it post-disposition? How, what are your requirements? Are you going to take people with honorable discharges, general discharges? You have to come up with your whole plan. And the way the federal training is, they don't le let you leave until you have a plan for implementation when you get back home. And, and, and that's what we did. We put together our plan. We came back. We met with the community. We met with anyone that wanted to hear from us. And we opened. And we opened with one person, but um, tomorrow will be our fourth um, graduating class. So we have um, we've been in existence that long. We have graduation in conjunction with Veterans Day every year. So our fourth graduating class is uh, tomorrow. So um, that's how we started, um, and. The trial court also now has committed to opening these courts throughout the state. Um, Judge Sinnott's was the next court in the Boss Municipal Court, and um, we've expanded to Lawrence, uh, we've expanded to Holyoke, and we've expanded to Framingham. So we're in three additional counties. Um, the plan is to have access to the appropriate specialty court for any, every criminal defendant that enters into the district courts and the Boston Municipal Court. So that's the plan. It's a big plan. Um, but we have made consistent, um, uh, uh, we've consistently provide, expanded uh, in conjunction with that plan. So that's where we stand at this point. So um, my planning was a lot easier because I just lifted everything from Judge Hogan Sullivan, <laughs> who had already created all I the I already documents. lifted it from Judge Russell, and, so it's okay. Uh, and Judge Russell was my mentor court, uh, so we were able to talk to him um, and his people. Uh, so the planning part of it uh, actually came uh, really easily. Uh, what happened with me was that I have served as a uh, Navy intelligence officer, um, I was attached to Special Operations Command. I have worked um, with combat veterans a lot. Um, I have worked with Navy SEALs and Rangers and Green Berets, and I um, have really seen some of the, and they've discussed with me some of the things that have really gone on with them. And what they've, um, and I've also seen them um, deal with their stress with alcohol, and that can sometimes um, just, sometimes be something that um, most people um, think might be a little on the um, more ex extreme end of things in a bar. Um, so I can understand bar fights or, or bar things being something that we would take in our court. But I think the thing that really um, made me decide that I really wanted to start a veterans treatment court uh, was when um, I'd heard about it, my, my chief wanted to start it, um, but then I heard a story. Uh, this was told to me by a defense attorney. Um, and he told me this story about a Marine. And the Marine um, had spent one year in Fallujah. And I think all of you know what was going on in Fallujah. He returned in 2009. He had no record. And he had a Purple Heart. He was arrested shortly thereafter for OUI. He, de he uh, had no attorney. He um, pled to a continued without a finding, which is not unusual for a for first offense. Um, but he had PTS severely. He was self-medicating to the point of drunkenness every day. Um, but he could hold down a job. Um, he, then he was arrested about a year later for a second OUI. This time he hired an attorney. And this is the attorney who told me this story, who was a veteran. And this attorney was really optimistic. He said, this case was defensible. I think I can get him a not guilty. Two weeks later, he was arrested for an OUI third. The attorney, but that case was a strong case. So this attorney said, okay, let me try to combine the two OUIs. Um, let me try to get him 14-day residential treatment program, talked to the um, district attorney, uh, talked about this highly decorated Marine. Um, can we do this? And the DA's office said yes. They presented it to the court. It was rejected. Because the judge felt concerned about this veteran, said, I think that that person needs a, like six months intensive treatment. He felt that there was uh, no choice except to try the case. Uh, he was hoping for not guilty on the OUI second. It, he came away with a guilty. He asked for a stay for sentencing. He asked the judge for, can I look into PTS and alcohol 
treatment for this veteran. The judge said fine, gave him a stay. But remember, he was still facing a third OUI, and that case was a strong case. Ten days later, he committed suicide. When you hear about a case like that, you wonder what could have been done. And I really do believe that, who knows if a veterans court would have helped this individual, but it sure, certainly would have given him his best chance. Um, we, uh, the, the veterans treatment courts is a total sobriety court. Uh, you, you, you are sober the whole time. Uh, there is twice a week minimum drug testing or alcohol testing. Um, we put sobrieters on veterans when we have concerns about alcohol use. They are really monitored carefully. We see them every week. Um, so it's a really regimented program. They meet with their mentors. They meet with their probation officer every week. Uh, they have to go to their treatment plans. They have to um, go to their groups. They have to go to at least three AANAs a week. I mean, anyone who tells you that uh, just because in, in my court, most of the cases will end up with a dismissal that they're getting off easy. Absolutely not. This probation is so intensive, a, generally 18, to, 18 months to two years. So, um, so that's, why, you know, that's how, how my veterans court um, in Boston got started. So as these specialty courts are expanding um, and growing across the country, how do we know that they're working? What efforts are being undertaken to measure success, and what are the um, metrics that you use to measure success? Is it just recidivism rates, or are there other things that um, we look to? Well, um, that's something that, that um, we're a little bit lacking in. Um, however, we know how important it is. Nationally, um, the data is quite impressive that, um, that these if we break the cycle of the revolving door of people coming into the court system, being placed on probation, picking up a new charge, being reprobated, picking up another charge, uh, then maybe doing a short bit at the um, House of Correction, if we haven't addressed the underlying issue, that's going to continue to happen. And so that's the, the idea behind these courts is to address the underlying issue. So we try to, to address, um, I suppose the most important thing is the recidivism rate. Um, our, the um, folks that know about statistics, which I am not among them, the tell us that you need to look back at least three years for your recidivism data. So this year is the first year we would have that three-year look back with regard to the court in Dedham. And uh, so looking at re-arrest rates from the, our first graduating class, um, the recidivism rate is 11.5 percent. Um, which is, is quite good, um, considering the fact that if you target high-risk, high-need uh, defendants, um, the, the recidivism rate on general probation is roughly 60 percent. So, so that data is, is quite impressive. It's, we, we don't have a lot of numbers yet, but, but we are looking at that. We also um, have, and we haven't used it with the veterans courts yet, but we, we did have a grant um, where we were um, not only following uh, court data and recidivism data, but we were linked to the um, Department of Public Health database so that we could follow treatment data because that's the other piece of it is following the treatment data so that we can determine what kinds of treatments are effective and what kinds of treatments are not effective. So linking those to um, the criminal justice data with the Department of Public Health data I think is going to give us some, some richer data, but, but we're, we're in the beginning stages of that right now. And um, nationally there's just one national study that I'm aware of so far. There are a number of courts that have done process evaluations that uh, shows uh, tremendous outcomes. Uh, there is one statewide uh, study that was done in the state of Ohio. And from that data, it, it shows that uh, how successful veterans treatment courts are in this state of Ohio. Uh, tremendous outcomes. 
uh, with respects to that study. When you talk about how do we measure success, uh, recidivism is one measure, but there are a number of other measures, such as the number of um, jail, prison days, and the costs related to that. Uh, what about family reunification? What about veterans who come to the court and are homeless, but now have safe, a stable, habitable housing? What about veterans who come to the program and are unemployed, but now are actively employed and caring for themselves or their families? Uh, what about for veterans who are younger veterans or maybe more mature veterans who have an interest in wanting to go forward and go to school, go to college? What about uh, job skills, job trainings? So jurisdictions who are exploring and setting up Veterans Treatment Court, there are a number of data elements when you talk about success and how we measure success and the difference in the changes in people's lives to be in a, a safer, healthier, uh, stable, and productive in our communities. Thank you. We are at a law school, so I would like to ask a question about lawyers. What is the role of attorneys in the veterans treatment court system? Major Simone, you've referred to um, defense counsel and as first responders. Yes. Um, can you say a little bit more about the role of attorneys? Sure I can. Um, one other point is I know it says Major Simone here, but I just want you to know I'm not here in an official capacity. I'm here in a personal capacity. And the military actually would like me to share with you that they do not endorse the positions that I'm sharing. <laughs> Perhaps one day that will change. But uh, in answer to your question, uh, it, it really does seem like involvement in the court system oftentimes is, is just something that will happen in many cases with veterans who have acute needs that, that have not been met yet. Maybe the military wasn't able to diagnose and treat. So that our, our court systems, in fact, have become responsible in, in this first response capacity, and certainly that includes everyone in the courts, from the judges uh, to the attorneys. And in terms of responsibilities, I, I know that a lot of uh, pro bono uh, or, you know, there's, there's efforts now underway for individuals to help serve veterans who have not themselves been in the military but want to help. It's important to recognize that participation in litigation in any form can be very traumatizing on its own, right? It's, you, they call it forensic stress disorder in a lot of places. And drawing on the literature from therapeutic jurisprudence, this idea that you want to try to find places where there might be more discomfort and try to plan for them and try to build in ways to de-escalate stress rather than increase it, that's something that's, uh, that's very appropriate to attorneys who are working with veterans. Uh, it, one of the things to recognize is that these individuals may have specific anniversary dates of the trauma they suffered, and it's important to know that. And if these, these participants are undergoing common methods of, of uh, exposure therapy that the Department of Veterans Affairs used, uses, it's not uncommon that they will be um, revisiting some of the most traumatizing experiences in their lives through the course of treatment, whether it's through uh, prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy, even uh, uh, EMDR. No matter what it is, th there's a chance that if, if you're seeing a client who's going through treatment, you really want to know what stage of treatment it is and how, how recently has that client undergone a session where they have to relive their experiences. So it, it's almost like as an attorney, you, you, you should adopt an enhanced client counseling posture where you're trying to work with the client to identify what kind of triggers inherent in the litigation could set them off. And then you try to plan to avoid those. And, and uh, in a very real way, this also includes, you know, uh, to use a military term, I call it long-range reconnaissance, where you try to identify family members and social supports so that if these clients don't show up 
for, for, for times to meet with you. You know who to call to ask about it, and you can tell them when to contact you to try to uh, be there as a resource and, and maintain that communication when there's so many different factors. Um, we, we could go on, but I, I think that the idea is be, be ready to experience stress responses in your own presence and, and have a plan on how you're going to deal with that. Think about uh, when you don't have a psychologist on hand, when you may be talking about crucial decisions that are, are going to affect this individual for the rest of his or her life, be prepared to respond to it. And some of that could be just taking breaks, uh, using uh, de-escalation, breathing techniques, whatever it might be, but, but have a plan and, and try to think about the types of things that have, have quote-unquote, set the client off in the past so that you're better prepared. So Judge Russell talked a little bit in his presentation about the many partnerships um, with the VA and other organizations and other people um, that enable the Veterans Treatment Court to be effective. And your comments, Major Simone, about the need to collaborate with medical professionals and family members um, underscores the need for those partnerships. I was curious if um, our judges might share a little bit more about the partnerships that they have in their courtrooms, um, either with the VA or other organizations um, to su better support their veterans. Um, we have the uh, typical, the VJO, the Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinator from the um, Veterans Administration, um, and we have a peer mentor coordinator from the state um, Veterans Affairs Office. Uh, we also have um, a representative from the VA for the VET Center. And um, one of the lucky things that we have is a private entity called Home Base, which uh, is a partnership between Mass General Hospital and um, the Red Sox. And what they do is they um, give counseling services, family counseling, and do um, all sorts of services for veterans. So uh, they, really feel, they, they really fill a uh, stopgap. So we're really lucky to have them on our team. Um, and then typically you have the probation officer and um, uh, both uh, the defense attorney and the ADA as part of the team also. I think that... Um uh, as opposed to in drug courts, um, the, the community wants very much to support veterans. And so I think that it's, uh, if you make known that you have this program, people come and want to help. Um, the, the DAV is an invaluable um, source for us. Not only do they provide transportation, which they do on a regular basis for us, um, but they also, um, they, we have a whole closet full of suits um, so that when our veterans are going out to uh, job interviews and things like that, we've got, we've got a closet full of suits. Any size, shape, color, we've got it. Um, we've got... Um, a, uh, our DAV um, representatives um, somehow show up with Red Sox tickets. They never invite me to go, but the veterans go. And um, so there's all kinds of people in the community that are, that are very willing to help. And, and so it's, it's kind of easy to tap into those resources. Um, and I wanted to add one thing that Judge Russell had mentioned in his talk, and that is that we have a requirement in our court um, to, for our veterans to perform community service. And at first, I, th I thought that was a little odd, because how, what greater service could these men and women do than to serve in the military? But um, I, I was wrong about that. The community service is a very important um, addition to our court, and it, and it does a couple of things. One, it, it restores the, um, the individuals. Um, he, he already wanted to serve, and he still wants to serve, and so this gives, reinforces um, that notion that he had in the first place. So he wanted to serve his country, 
and now he wants to give back again, and it's um, something that's a good thing. It's good for the person inside. But secondly, it gives the, uh, most of our veterans do community service in veterans organizations. And so it gives them the ability to meet other veterans in the community. Many of these um, men and women have isolated before they got to us. Um, so it, it gives them the opportunity to be back in the community, meeting other people uh, at, at sober events, and, and they, they are building that kind of structure in the community, the support that they need back in the community. So it's been a very good thing to do, even though I thought at first it wasn't the right thing to do. So I'm curious to hear your perspectives about the challenges of uh, veterans treatment courts. I'll highlight just one um, that we had discussed previously, which is um, veterans who have less than fully honorable discharges. Um, the VA estimates itself that 20% of justice-involved veterans aren't eligible for VA benefits based on their discharge status. And as you have noted, many of the services um, in the community that you're partnering with to provide to your veterans may require VA health care eligibility. Um, I highlight this because this is one area of practice in our clinic is we work on discharge upgrades, um, which can be... Um, life-changing um, cases if you're able to actually upgrade someone's discharge, but it can take a lot of work and a long time, and um, the applications are not always successful. So uh, how do you handle those challenges, um, working with veterans who may not have an honorable discharge or other groups of veterans who um, may face other challenges? Well, we use the um, private services um, sometimes home base can have some flexibility, even though um, they're really um, supposed to be for um, veterans of um, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but the, they really do try to bend over backwards and also, and then we just have to um, use Salvation Army program or whatever we can. Um, our um, peer mentor coordinator, Don Purrington, is really terrific about um, finding programs uh, that will take these individuals, but it's, it is a challenge and it's very limited. And we do um, think of uh, getting their um, uh, discharge upgraded mm -hmm. also. So it's an interesting question because it has so many dimensions. I think that one important thing is to recognize that, uh, especially for individuals who enlisted, they may have prior periods of honorable service. So it's important to identify how many DD-214s do they actually have. And the calculus is that if you have a disability or anything related to a period of honorable service that was actually completed, you can still get benefits related to that period. It's only the period f that's not considered to be honorable that you have other problems. So that's the first point is try to identify whether that individual has a prior honorable discharge. Uh, another concern here is, and these, these, this is something that's becoming increasingly clear as the military has uh, grown smaller. It is eliminating more individuals. Some of those individuals have uh, administrative discharges under other than honorable conditions. So what's coming to light are a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that's coming to light is that a lot of military offenses that are, are the basis for eliminating these individuals uh, don't have any parallel in the civilian world. These are very unique, uh, uniquely military offenses like um, not showing up for work, like disrespecting someone in a higher position, uh, f not following an order. And, and unfortunately, uh, when you look at the symptoms of individuals who have PTSD and TBI, uh, these military offenses are disproportionately targeting what can be symptoms of what we understand to be war-related injuries, and that's, that's kind of alarming and concerning. So it, there, there's been increased pressure right now. A number of senators are trying to impose moratoriums on the issuance of other than honorable discharges to individuals who have diagnosed PTSD, uh, but that has not that has not happened yet. So you have you have these individuals. The first question to ask when they leave the military and, and have um, either a bad conduct discharge from something that is less than a general court martial, or if they have an 
other than honorable conditions discharge from a, an administrative separation hearing, or if it was before the mid-70s, if they have an undesirable administrative discharge. All of these three types of discharges fall into a gray area where it's not necessarily true that they're barred for benefits. And in a lot of cases, there's, a mis there's misinformation out there that if you have one of these other than fully honorable discharges, then go home, there's no services available for you. Uh, instead, the VA has to conduct its own uh, individualized review called a character of service determination. But the long story short is it still may be possible, depending on the nature of the offense and, and some other factors, it still may be possible that those individuals are eligible for uh, crucial benefits, which could include vocational rehabilitation that could even get them into a college learning a skill even if they wouldn't qualify for the GI Bill. So w one of the thoughts is it's really important to ally with veterans service organizations and veterans claims officers who deal with these complex regulatory and statutory bars to benefits and maybe even integrate them into the staff of the treatment team so that they can help see how likely it is that it still may be possible to write someone in uh, for benefits. Thank you. So I have more questions, but there may be some of you in the audience that have questions and would like to ask uh, of individual panelists or of the group. Um, so two of my colleagues do have mics available if anyone would like to ask a question. We have one in the back over here. Thank you. Um, my first question is, um, has the uh, Department of Defense had any interaction with any of the judges as far as um, what their role could be in, in these matters? I think a, a lot of uh, the folks that come in front of you are kind of left at your doorstep uh, by the DOD, and, and they seem to have some responsibility here. And I'm wondering if anyone's reached out to any, any of you judges or any of your courts. Um, uh, the second question is about mentors for the two Massachusetts uh, judges. How does one become a mentor? Uh, what's the criteria? And uh, do you need more mentors? Because I could certainly yes. spread the word. Uh, yes, we can help you with that. No problem. <laughs> with regards to the Department of Defense, uh, yes, there's been ongoing communications uh, with the Department of Defense over the years. Uh, just as a footnote, um, within the last year, there is now a Veterans Treatment Court uh, run by the uh, Federal District Court on the military base of Fort Hood. So just wrapping your mind around, you, you know you have to have a certain amount of relationship, understanding, clearance with the Department of Defense to do something as uh, really forward as that and to have it occur on the military base itself. A number of courts do work with commanders of maybe bases located nearby, commanders of National uh, Guards, commanders of the reserves of potentially if one of their active members is coming through the criminal justice system having the court have the opportunity to work with them rather than proceeding forward with potentially uh, disciplinary actions that may cause that person to be separated, particularly if that person is a, um, a good um, um, service member, but just is having a challenging and difficult time. Because we know in the most recent conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan on occasions, uh, close to half of those individuals uh, that served over there were activated reservists or guards person. So uh, there is ongoing relationships, not only with the DOD from the Pentagon side, but also individual courts relationships with military bases in their communities or guard stations. 
Yeah, m military discipline is a really interesting thing because it's the commanders who, who actually impose it. And um, commanders at the installation level, sometimes they have really positive relationships with the judges in their community. And I, I can think of one. When I was uh, stationed at Fort Benning and handled the military justice matters there, um, we even had a, an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with the local family drug court to try to help dependents who commit crimes on the military installation actually get treatment through the local courts. Um, at Fort Benning, we had a court-martial. It was a general court-martial of an officer who had TBI and PTSD, uh, some very serious charges with violence, injury, and some you know, conduct on becoming an officer, just a lot of uniquely military and also uh, civilian-type offenses. We were able, uh, after working for over a year, we were able to incorporate participation in the Muskogee County, Georgia Veterans Treatment Court. Uh, we worked that into the plea agreement in a general court martial and suspended the confinement. So this gentleman was actually spared having to spend a day of an 18-month sentence because he did go and successfully complete a veterans treatment court at the state level as a condition of his agreement with the commanding general who had instituted that court martial. That's, that's one of the first times we had that actually happen, but of course, inspired by the work of everyone sitting at this table. Uh, it is important to think about the power of suspending a punitive discharge and allowing someone to have a future that is not something marked with that scarlet letter that can bar them from having VA benefits and can really just change society at large. And it, it would be great to see the Department of Defense permitting and encouraging more commanders to use these tools, take advantage of these local resources, and, and suspend these, these punitive discharges. In terms of your question for mentors, um, all we need from a mentor is someone who has previously served um, and is willing to have uh, weekly contact um, with the mentor and um, field calls and see them uh, every so often, have coffees, check out how they're doing. Um, uh, Judge Hogan Sullivan and I have the same uh, peer mentor coordinator, Don Purrington, who really runs the peer mentors. And over there, um, there are brochures. Um, on the back of the brochure is an email address um, to Ms. Jerzak, and she can get you in, con if you just contact Ms. Jerzak through this email and say, I'm interested in becoming a mentor, um, we can fill you in. It's a very quick, short application, get you in contact with Don Purrington, and then you'd be good to go. Hi, yes, uh, I'm Steve Connor. I'm a veteran service officer in the other side of the state, out in the wild, wild west. Um, I wanted, one was a comment and another one was kind of a question. Uh, the comment was, is there's also those veterans who may not be VA health eligible uh, with a general discharge. Mm -hmm. um, they are eligible depending on their time. And some of it is not that they've done two years, so the VA can't quite step in but veteran service officers in the community can help them out. And we can also get them connected with civilian services and help pay for that. So that's one of the good things we have in Massachusetts. The other thing I was wondering, and uh, I've dealt with a lot of returning veterans, and we, we did it under the Vietnam War where we isolated all those veterans and said, well, you know, you lost or it's bad, or we had all those issues. Now it seems like the pendulum has swung completely the other way, and every veteran who served now is a hero. And so we, we, all the marketing that goes around saying, oh, hire our heroes, and everything heroes. And so when you have a veteran who, on the outside, or coming home who has issues, who's struggling, is it sometimes, do you find it difficult to deal with them with their honorable service and now having the issue of uh, being home and, and stepping down a little bit or falling and getting back up and, and how do the peers work with that? Do they see it a lot? I know I see it sometimes in my office and it's really hard so I can see them not automatically identifying that they have military service because of it. So I just didn't know what you were seeing in the courts and thank you for 
the work because now we have one out in Holyoke and it's awesome. You do. The Holyoke court is awesome. Um, that's one of the key issues that, that is identification of veterans. Um, when when uh, we started the court in Dedham, when we were applying to go to Tulsa, I w was trying to bolster our application by identifying how many veterans were coming through our court. And uh, so when you come into the criminal court system in Massachusetts, one of the first things you do is you answer a number of questions from a probation officer to determine your indigency, uh, to determine whether or not you're eligible for court-appointed counsel. So we, I took that form in Dedham, and we got a typewriter, and we typed in, have you ever served in the military as a question on the form. I subsequently found out it was an SJC form, which nobody can touch, um, but they didn't know about it, so it was okay. Um, we now have the Valor Act in Massachusetts, which requires that question to be asked of everyone who comes into the criminal court system. But that's all self-report. And I think when we ran the data with regard to uh, some of the people who are incarcerated, when the sheriff's department runs that data, the uh, number of non unreported um, veterans is quite high. I think it's like 60%. So veterans are not self-identifying necessarily. Some of that is because they don't, they don't understand the question. Some people who, you know, were in the Army, but they don't think they're a veteran, or, 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 so there's a little bit of confusion about that. There's confusion because the definition of a veteran for the VA is different from the, de the definition from the Department of Veteran Services in Massachusetts. And a, I think a big chunk of it is the shame factor, and, and I think that's what you're referring to. It, it's... They, they served and now they're embarrassed, they've let down their buddies, that kind of thing. The other factor, I think, is they're, they're concerned that either they or their um, spouse or children may, might uh, lose benefits if, if the uh, fact that they were arrested and charged becomes known. So what we have to do, and we have to do it better, is to be able to take the lists from the court of the people who are being arraigned and run it through the veterans system so that we can get a better number. We, we are doing it on the back end. If people are detained uh, in the jail, we're doing it on the back end when they get to the House of Correction. I think at least half of the sheriffs are, are doing that. We're trying to get the whole state to do that. DOS, the Department of Correction is already doing that. But it's the people who are not detained is that in the middle. And, and so we're working on trying to get that done easily. As you say, they have it on the uh, criminal form, which is about right. It would almost be awesome if we had it on all the probate forms as well. Sure. That's true. We have time for one more question here in the middle. Thank you. Um, I actually come with an offer. Uh, I, for 20 years, have facilitated alternatives to violence project workshops in the state prisons. Uh, we train insiders to work with us. Uh, some of my very best inside people are veterans. Um, AVP would love to offer this. We, we want to go upstream in the river of, of violence, and we would love to offer it for both your clientele and your veteran mentors. Uh, it's, we're, you know, all volunteer organization, and I uh, would love, I have information if anybody would care to have it. Great, thank you. So just before we close, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to briefly, if possible, um, share their perspectives about the future of veterans treatment courts. Should we expect the growth
to continue? Should the specialization um, focusing on veterans' needs in particular continue? Um, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts before we end. All right. Um, yes, it will continue. <laughs> and I think um, one of the goals is having the availability of, of Veterans Treatment Court available to every veteran in need, no matter where they are in the uh, continental U.S. or its territories. Uh, so it could be in the form of regional veterans treatment courts because some areas uh, may be very rural where the numbers uh, may not warrant setting up a, a separate veterans treatment court, but if it's a regional location, a number of uh, states and jurisdictions are considering that. Uh, and I think I'll pass it on. Uh, um, they, at the minimum, I believe it's sensitizing our justice system. Uh, the lawyers, the judges, and those who practice in the justice system on the needs of our veterans. Um, and I'm going to actually pass it to Judge Hogan Sullivan because she's really in charge of the expansion of the veterans treatment courts. and. Um, with the ambition of making sure that it's, it is accessible to um, any defendant veteran who needs it. And, and I would agree with um, Judge Russell and Judge Sinnott. Um, we are trying to expand so that we have access throughout uh, Massachusetts. There are parts of the state, for example, the Cape has a very large veteran population, but it's not, not in our criminal courts. So um, we're trying to be smart about where we locate these courts. We're also doing them regionally. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to do that in Norfolk County because it's a, a, a manageable size. If you look at Middlesex, I'm concerned that the court in Framingham is going to be inundated very soon because Middlesex County is so large. So we'll have to adjust and, and put one in a different part of that county. But we are trying those things. I think with regard to the question of whether or not these courts should expand and should continue, I think you got a very um, good example with the um, drawing that um, Judge Russell uh, had on the screen. When we started our court, we anticipated that the bulk of the people that we served were young veterans who served in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that has not been the case. We service veterans from the age of 19. Um, I actually turned down a veteran of the Korean War. I, I valor acted it. it, it uh, the Veterans Treatment Court was too intensive for that gentleman. But that's the age range. And so we, we ought not forget that um, just as just Judge Russell suggested, sometimes when someone comes, returns from combat, they get right back into life, things are going on, and they deflect the issues that they don't want to face until something, uh, and it might be retirement, gives them this free time and those kinds of things can happen. So the, it's, it's not something that's strictly related to a recent war. It, it covers several generations, and, and that's the other reason why I think these courts are important and why they need to expand. And just to build off of that idea that our, our court systems are, are necessarily serving in this first responder mode to PTSD, TBI, and other operational and combat stress injuries, Think about our family courts. I, I would suggest to you that family court judges get to see veterans' issues uh, at an even greater rate than our criminal courts, with, with things that don't make it to the criminal justice system but nevertheless happen, uh, including domestic and interpersonal violence. Uh, and the thought is that maybe we can expand this model not only within the criminal justice system, but also in all of the courts that frequently encounter veterans. And in that regard, I know that Buffalo is a really special place. I had a chance to work with and, and meet uh, Justice Jan Rosa, who created an honoring military families docket 
in her family court in Buffalo, and that was specialized for the family members coming through and divorcing. And she even uh, developed a system where the spouse would also get a mentor. So this is, this is really an idea about how to bring veterans who are in need closer to the resources that will best help them, their families, and therefore the community. So maybe anywhere we, where we find these veterans in crisis, this is a wonderful model to assist them. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you spending your time and sharing your expertise and your experience. Please join me in thanking our panelists. pleasure uh, to work with uh, disabled American veterans uh, to put on this fantastic event. And one of the quirky things uh, that the military does and the veterans community has also embraced uh, is the addition of coins. Um, and recently, uh, the Armed Forces Association uh, just got our first coins back. And we're <laughs> very proud of them. And so we're proudly giving them out. Um, and I would just uh, be honored to present one of them uh, to each one, uh, each one of you. And thank you very much. Uh, both uh, for your action or er, for your words today and uh, and your actions, I can tell you from personal experience. Uh, I've had soldiers of mine that have gone through these similar programs, um, and they absolutely save lives. And that's uh, that's not hyperbole. So thank you very much. Thank you.